Congrats, guys. We made it. To my fellow graduating seniors, you guys are some of the smartest engineers that I know. Now let's go out there and show the world what we can do. Go War Diggers. That's been a heck of a ride. I'm really thankful for all the friendships that I've made here in Mines. Um, I know we're all going to be successful in any path that we choose. I think one of the most special things about Mines is that the atmosphere is so welcoming and fun. Professors are accessible and helpful, and I really hope that we can all carry that attitude of teaching and learning with us into the working world. Being a graduate from Mines, I think it's mark of excellence because you did it. For a lot of us, getting this degree is the final big step before entering the real world, and it just feels surreal. I couldn't be more excited than to bring along a lot of the memories and lessons I've learned at my time in Mines. Congratulations, Mines graduates. We got to start college by carrying a 10 pound rock up a mountain, and now the day we've all been waiting for, when we finally get to cross that virtual Zoom stage. My fellow students, have fun out there. You are now among the most elite, an or digger alumni. May your resilience and brilliance take you far into your future career paths. Go class of 2020, woo! If you are familiar with our university, you know that for the past 146 years, Mines has focused on producing the top scientists and engineers, industry leaders, entrepreneurs, and the knowledge and innovations that the world needs. A Mines degree instantly commands respect. It communicates a strong work ethic and perseverance, and it indicates that you are resilient, a great team player, and that you're ready to tackle anything. Congratulations, class of 2020. You are joining an elite group of engineers recognized the world over for their can-do attitude. Make us proud. Congratulations, way to go. We look forward to your future and all you're going to accomplish in your life. Go War Diggers. Congratulations, class of 2020. These are tough times right now. We've had them before and we'll have them again. And you'll make it through. Go get them more diggers. Great job, everyone. I'm so proud of all of us and can't wait to see where we all head to next. All right, congratulations, everyone. Well, good evening, everyone out there in virtual land. We are so glad that you are able to join us. Uh, that video, uh, some of the footage was from our online commencement ceremony, which was quite a success a couple weeks ago. And we welcomed a new uh, class of graduates into the world. And uh, there's no doubt they'll be successful. Once again, thanks for attending. Uh, we really wish you the best in health and hopefully you're staying safe uh, during these challenging times. We're really excited to bring this state of minds to you. Over 550 people signed up for this event. So we're really excited about um, being able to share with you what's going on with minds, uh, some successes over the last year and uh, what the future holds for us. Uh, my name is Brian Winklebauer, and I'm the president and CEO of the Colorado School of Mines Foundation, uh, part of the Mines leadership team, and um, here with uh, several other colleagues uh, to bring you some hopefully helpful information. Uh, as you would imagine, in true ore digger fashion, the Mines community has uh, risen up to meet these challenging times, and I, I couldn't be prouder of my colleagues on this call, the administration, the, the faculty and the students for their perseverance in adapting to the changes we've, we've all had to endure. And um, as, as Mines alumni know well, you, uh, you understand this because you've been through it, but we continue to teach our students that um, there are lessons, important lessons to be learned through challenges and disruption. And that's certainly what we've had recently and relative to our external constituencies, our alumni, our partners, our donors, uh, we have seen the Mines community become galvanized, uh, really come together in support of this great institution. Uh, you know, one of the measures of a special top of mind university is having external stakeholders who advocate for and support it. And we've seen just an overwhelming uh, desire from alumni and friends to help Mines during this time. 
we're extremely grateful uh, for all of the support. And uh, we've done our best to respond to the questions, the amazing amount of questions re we've received about how can I help um, by creating a number of uh, opportunities for people to do their part uh, in a way that's meaningful to them. And in particular, we've uh, put together the Rise Up for Minds uh, mini campaign, which has been a tremendous success. So I want to thank you all for being a part of uh, the Minds family and for supporting it, especially during this time. It is um, very much appreciated. We thank you for being or givers, that's for sure. Uh, in particular, I want to um, recognize uh, the efforts of the Minds Alumni Board of Directors, uh, led by President Bill Zish and uh, Stu Bennett, um, who is uh, uh, working with uh, the foundation to help with alumni engagement activities. The alumni board is well represented on this call tonight, and we want to thank them for their partnership and advocacy um, and leadership uh, during this time. So uh, thank you all um, for that. Uh, this uh, state of minds is another way we want to be responsive to you and your concerns about the future plans. Um, you'll hear from uh, President Paul Johnson and some others from Minds leadership team, including uh, Dr. Rick Holtz, uh, who's the provost, uh, Dr. Dan Fox, the vice president of student life, and Ms. Kirsten Volpe, who's the chief operating officer and chief financial officer for Minds. Uh, we hope to have a lot of time um, available to answer your questions. We'll get to many of them, as many of them as we possibly can. And as you would imagine, not every detail is, is fully finalized, but I think you'll find that most of your questions will be addressed. And we thank you all for uh, submitting questions in advance. That was very helpful. And uh, we've tried to put together a program that will um, uh, answer a lot of those questions. So, and, and a special members of the Minds community, we want to provide you an insider's look into what we're working on. So with that, I'd like to introduce Minds President and Professor Paul Johnson. Okay, all right, we'll see if I'm the only person who forgets to unmute before they talk, but um, it's, uh, yeah, we, we have a thing going on here. You gotta put a dollar in the tip jar or something whenever you forget to, to do that, but, uh, Welcome everybody to this event. It, it's so great to have you here. Um, uh, I wish I could see all of you, but uh, it, it always feels good when we have a lot of people, uh, a lot of ore diggers all together at, at once. And as Brian said, uh, first and foremost, we hope that all of you are doing well and that uh, you are navigating uh, this change in the world wherever you are. And we're gonna spend a little time telling you about uh, what's been going he on here at Mines. And I wanna thank all of you for the questions that you've sent in. Uh, obviously we'll answer other ones that you have if you use the, um, the, uh, the Q and A box down there. Brian will navigate some of those questions for us in a while. But I put together a real brief presentation to just sort of uh, guide us through uh, some of the things that'll address some of your questions and just to uh, give you a sense of where we're going and then we can get into some pretty specific things. But, um, overall, thanks so much for, for being here and um, spending your time with us tonight. Um, again, we just, uh, we, we love it when we get so many ore diggers together. So I'm going to switch over to presentation for the few of you that phoned in. I, I apologize, we won't be able to see that, but um, I think you'll, we'll have some way you can go back and look at the slides if you'd like to, and I'll try to be uh, verbal enough to, uh, to, to just describe them. Um, so Let's see. I'm gonna get this. So hopefully you can. Uh, hopefully those of you on the screen can um, can see these slides. Uh, you know, all the focus has been on sort of what's happened since March, but I, I wanted to have a couple slides that talked about uh, a few things that happened before March because that was most of the school year, uh, and uh, and it it addresses. And I think sets the stage for some of the questions that you that you asked. So, first thing I just want to say is the, the the new school year started off fantastic. We had probably our largest uh, incoming class and the most diverse incoming class, one that was highly academically accomplished, and um, we were really excited to have them joining us. It it looks like um, we we will have uh, as 
an equally accomplished and fantastic class coming to us in the fall, judging from the uh, admissions data that we have so far. And um, for those of you who have any connections to the incoming students, please tell them we are extremely excited that we're going to be seeing them. And we'll be telling you a little bit more about what that fall is, uh, is going to look like. You know, when they when they joined us, the, the other thing I, I sort of like to point out is, um, depending on when you went to mines, um, you all had sort of, uh, you know, perhaps differing educational experiences. But one of the things I wanted to point out is how uh, a lot of your questions had to do with, for example, are we still doing field sessions and things like that, because those are uh, in labs because those have a lot of the hands-on components and obviously we all value the, the, the hands-on and doing things component of a mind's education. I just wanted to point out that, that um, from the day students walk in to the day they graduate, we've got them working in design competitions where we're emphasizing making things and hands-on stuff that starts with the cornerstone program. It goes to the capstone pro program at the senior year. In between there's design challenges, innovation challenges, and things like that that students participate in. And if, if you're not familiar with those, I just wanted to um, put a couple of addresses down here. Um, go in and take a look at cornerstone.minds.edu and you'll see the kinds of projects students are working on as freshmen. And then check out capstone.minds.edu and you'll see the whole showcase of the senior design projects that were done this year. And at innovation.minds.edu, you can learn about the innovation challenges. But um, you know, it's, it's not just the labs in the field sessions where the hands-on integrated engineering takes place anymore, but it, it happens from the day that, you, day, that, day that you walk in the door. And as we think about what we're doing in the fall and as we're going forward and talking about important parts of the education, I just wanna make sure everybody understands these, these things are as important to us as the, the labs perhaps in the field sessions that you're used to. The other thing that's really important to us are the extracurriculars that students are engaged in in professional development because I, I think students, um, you know, a lot of mine's qualities come from these activities. And uh, if you go to our newsroom, you'll see all of the competitions our students were involved in nationally and internationally and, and how well they were doing and, and how proud they make us um, uh, that, that they're from, from mines. And of course, showing how great uh, our, our students are uh, as engineers and applied scientists. And I just wanted to point out for, you know, this year, one of our student teams, um, first time ever won the, uh, the international solar decathlon competition in Africa. And, you know, again, to sort of illustrate the difference perhaps of a, of a mines education and the, the importance of these components that maybe weren't as important um, a couple decades ago. This is a group of students that on their own, you know, basically in their own free time, if you can imagine having any free time as a mine student, they figured out how to build a solar sustainable house on a different continent in about a three week period of time. And, uh, and did it so well that they won this international competition. So, um, you know, that's the, that, that, those are the other kinds of experiences that we, we are trying to figure out how to continue to, to replicate in this new world that we're in and the importance. The other thing, of course, that I feel is very important to extracurricular and professional development is our, is our athletics programs. And I know many of you are um, supporters and keenly interested in our athletics programs and we'll answer some questions about that later as we go on, but, but to me, it's another one of those things that uh, really contributes to the professional development of our, of our graduates. Um, it also provides you know, structure and exercise and um, a framework within which a lot of our students do extremely well academically. And I just wanted to mention, I know those of you who follow Minds Athletics know this, but um, they were having a fantastic year this year. They won their fifth straight conference championship cup as the best um, program in the conference. We were number one nationally um, before the NCAA shut down this year of all 400 or so Division II schools. The cross country team was national champions. The women came in third in the nation. We had seven conference championships, most number of All-Americans ever from um, Colorado School Mines. And if you're interested, you could go in and watch a recording of uh, the Blaster Awards and just learn about the amazing teams and um, student athletes that we have here at Mines. So I thought I'd mention that. Of course, uh, you know, the world changed in March and uh, we, we all had to deal with something we hadn't dealt with before and we didn't know what we were dealing with. We had to make the de tough decision that uh, our on-campus uh, resident students had to go home. Um, we had to go to basically remote distributed work mode where everybody was working from their dining room table or, um, you know, spare bedroom. 
Uh, we had to, within about a two week period of time, move all of our courses to online delivery. And uh, the amazing thing was that uh, students, faculty, and staff took it all in stride and made it happen. I mean, it was, it was, uh, this is pretty amazing to see this get done and the amount of work and dedication it took on everybody's part um, to make that happen. And, and I was really, really proud of mine. This is a screenshot of my class. I was teaching a class of about 45 students this uh, semester at eight o'clock on Monday and Wednesday mornings. And uh, this, is, this is what my class looked like uh, after, afterwards. So um, not, not, not what we were used to, but, uh, but we, we, we managed to get along with it. Of course, our goal this spring was really, we had two priorities. One is we wanted to protect the health of our community. And the second thing is we wanted to make sure that uh, all of our students continue to progress towards graduation. And, uh, and we were able to accomplish that. Um, again, everybody completed their coursework. Students that were gonna graduate, graduated. We were uh, honored to have uh, Governor Polis as our uh, distinguished invited speaker this year. And uh, he did a great job explaining why it was um, so the world really needs uh, ore diggers these days. So we, we were able to, uh, to get through that. Um, some of you have asked questions about whether or not uh, during that time frame we were involved in doing anything related to uh, the pandemic. And I, I think those of you know that we have a tradition that we, the, the M um, changes into numbers during that countdown to, to the end of the semester. And I, I just wanted to mention this year, um, Blue Key went up and turned the M into a, a red heart in honor of all of the essential workers um, in our area that were supporting all of us to be able to work from home, as well as to um, honor all those who, um, you know, gave their, gave their lives in, in, um, in their roles as first responders to this pandemic. So this was, this was our attempt to, um, you know, show as a community our, our support and thanks and uh, honoring all of those folks um, who are doing so much for us. In addition to that, we had um, you know students, of course, bright, ingenious. Uh, a lot of them have 3D printers at home. They started making uh, personal protective equipment to uh, hand out to essential workers, and um, uh, we had a lot of nice stories on the news about that. And if you go to our newsroom, you can find links to that. We also had one of our one of our freshmen uh, in Texas was working on a brand new um, respirator kind of unit uh, that would instead of the ones in the hospital that sort of um, actually damage your lungs over a period of time, this one was responsive to your breathing style. So I thought that was pretty cool and all for, you could create a unit that was cost about $500 to put together. So it was exciting to see um, that taking place. And of course the faculty were working on things that were also related. Um, one example is they were using artificial intelligence to try to predict um, our own personal uh, uh, risk of, uh, a threat from the from COVID-19. So anyway, a lot of cool stuff. And again, if you go to the newsroom um, at our website, you can you can read about some of these things. Uh, of course, now we're in the in the summer, and right now we're, we have two summer sessions that go on. Normally, this is the time of year when there's field sessions and some labs. The first summer session, everything's being delivered online. The second summer session, actually, we're we're having a, a combination of both remote delivery and in-person of some of the labs and field sessions. So we're, we're moving back in that direction and using that experience as an opportunity to um, calibrate what we're doing in the, in the fall, uh, which is of course what we're spending a lot of our time planning and preparing for. So we've, we've announced to campus and all of our returning and new students that our plan is to have uh, everybody return to campus and uh, have an in-person on campus experience starting in the fall. We're of course looking at a lot of different scenarios and um, what happens if we're not able to, to do that. Um, and of course, uh, as we, we're adjusting as we learn daily more about what we're, what we're dealing with. We're also expanding education opportunities, um, particularly at the graduate level for, for more online for um, students who uh, would, would like to do that at this point in time. And we're looking, uh, working a lot of external partnerships, particularly in the, in the realm of uh, health testing and tracking. So that's kind of what we're, we're working on overview. Um, there's some specifics about what's happening, which will answer some of your questions. And for, for these, I would like to invite um, our provost and vice president for um, student life. So first, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Rick Holtz. Rick joined us just about a year ago. 
And uh, he's our provost on campus, and he's been leading all of the efforts to dial in what we're doing from an academic standpoint in the fall. And I thought I'd ask him just take a minute and give you a, a to sort of a paint a broad brush, high level of uh, what what he's been working on along with the the deans and the faculty. So, Rick, you want to jump in briefly here? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, President Johnson. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just what I would indicate is that what we're looking at right now is to have about 60% of our courses to be face-to-face -face, and we're prioritizing having our design courses, our lab courses, uh, any uh, uh, courses that require students to be in a workshop, etc., cetera, uh, to be face-to-face. -face. We are uh, then trying to have most of our freshman courses be delivered in a face-to-face -face format. Uh, we are, as we're doing this though, we're looking at uh, making sure that students are safe by requiring students to wear face masks, by um, uh, decreasing the density of students within our classrooms. So we're probably increasing the number of sections we're teaching and we're um, looking at other ways, uh, not only distancing, but to keep students safe with disinfectant wipes and, and uh, hand sanitizer, et cetera. So there are multiple things going on with regard to the fall semester, uh, but primarily our students will be on campus with uh, a few remote classes and the majority of their coursework will be face-to-face. -face. Uh, with regard to the graduate programs, we uh, are asking the Board of Trustees on Friday to approve 11 new fully online graduate certificate programs. We've got uh, 13 other non-thesis masters and, and certificate programs that are already teed up to launch in an online format in the fall. So 24 total uh, online programs, which will launch this fall. And we also have two other new graduate programs, one in robotics and one on quantum computing that will also launch this fall. So we are definitely looking at alternative delivery methods in order to um, work with our corporate uh, partners to deliver the, the uh, course curriculum that they need. Great, thank, thank you, Rick. And, and I'll, I'll add, um, I, I know that Rick's working on just a, a couple other things as well on, um, since many of you asked a lot of questions about um, uh, being protective of, of uh, health and safety, and that is um, in addition to fewer students in classrooms and more sections, as Rick mentioned, we're looking at, so classes going from early in the morning to much later at night potentially using Saturdays in the schedule as well, and then staggering course time so that not everybody's going in and out of buildings at exactly um, the same point in time. So trying to reduce the, all of the, anything that we could do to reduce the potential for transmission, basically, um, they're, they're working in. And, and for um, students who are uncomfortable or, or have uh, conditions that don't allow them to participate in in-person classes, um, Rick and the, the deans and the department heads and the faculty are, are making sure that there are um, remote options for continuing their education as, as well. So um, students, students and their families will have a choice, which is the other thing they're working in. So lot, they're, they're, Rick, Rick and his team are pretty busy. Um, the, the other aspect of things is, a, is of course, uh, there's a residential component. There's a, um, just a whole student life aspect to things in the, in the COVID world. And I invited, uh, Dr. Dan Fox, who's Vice President for Student Life, if he'd make a, a few comments about things that he, his team is working on with, re, with regards to getting ready for the fall. Yeah, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you, President Johnson. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, wish I could see you, um, but I'm hoping you can see me and um, happy that you all joined in. Uh, I did want to point out one thing, too. If you're on Zoom and, you're, and you have the task bar at the bottom, there is a Q&A box down there that you can access to ask uh, questions if you would like um, through some of our other town halls and, and meetings. We've had a lot of folks um, provide those questions in real time as you hear our comments and others. So if you look on the bottom there, it should be uh, maybe right of where it says participants or share the screen. There's Q&A. 
So please access that as well, because um, I'm sure we won't be able to get to everything tonight. You know, when we think about March 20th or March 11th, uh, about the time when we did make the conversion, um, something that maybe some of you don't know is, is actually in student life in terms of all the support services that are happening outside the classroom, whether that be academic support services or leadership opportunities and so forth, a fair amount of those things, to some extent, we are al already using technology in a virtual way to connect with students because as the world has become more of a 24-7 operation, um, that gave students more opportunity to get those support services. Certainly, as we change into a more virtual mode, um, we've enhanced those things and we've actually learned quite a bit from that and we'll moving forward, irrespective of what tomorrow brings, we will definitely be utilizing that as another, if you will, arrow in our quiver of support for our students and, and their endeavors, whether that be purely academic or co-curricular or outside interests, as the president alluded to with some of the slides that he showed you. There's such a variety of things our students um, are interested in and are pursuing we want to make sure that we help build that. Um, when we talk about building a community, it's interesting. Um, when I go back to when we were starting with the Minds at 150 plan, I was kind of, I kept kind of throwing this phrase around about ubiquitous learning and this idea that on our campus, no matter where you are, you're always in a learning environment. Um, it's just a matter of the venue changing. And I would say with this newest challenge with us, we, Student Life certainly still looks at it in the same way. The modality has changed in some ways, um, but the learning never stops, nor does the connectivity. Um, the, the community is a tight-knit community, maybe a little bit bigger than when you were here, but still small. And so that tight-knitness and those standards of, of, um, of connecting and staying with each other as we work through um, you know, personal challenges, as we work through academic challenges, as we strive to do more um, in group settings and so forth is certainly a part of the community. And this idea of professional development and all that it entails and the different elements that you learn um, outside the the classroom as well as inside. As I think about that, you know, for us, most people always say the, the amazing standards that the academics um, are known for here in terms of not just rigor, but prestige and so forth. And certainly within student life, when we think about a signature experience, we want to have those, those elements, but we also put a, a lot of focus on the idea again of of when, when somebody graduates from Mines, not, all, not only are they very sharp in terms of their academics discipline, but also in terms of the idea that during their time they've developed citizenship skills, they've developed uh, a moral compass and ethics um, beyond what they came with, um, that their identity is, has been identified for them. They are you know, community minded when they think about the things that they go out into the world and global thinking in that way. And so essentially what we try to try to do is provide them a well-rounded education. So essentially, once they leave the institution and go out into the world, nothing really can stop them from doing anything that they so desire other than maybe themselves, even these circumstances. And you saw with Andy Flynn on the video, there are about tough times have happened before. Maybe some of you experienced them. Tough times will happen again. Um, but as a community, we stay strong and we stay together. Um, so we're spending a great deal of time um, on that now. Paul, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to talk about specific um, activities yet or if that would be later on in the presentation. Why, why don't we hang on to that for a little later, Dan? I figured. That, okay. Come up in the questions. Okay. Thank you. That'd be great. Um, Rick, I was going to suggest, um, I've been watching the questions that come in. It might be a good time to, a couple quick ones we could handle while, since you, you, in, you mentioned that we're launching all these um, graduate degrees. So they're, um, they're uh, you know, um, Kelly asked a question, are they all basically basically just online versions of existing programs or are they like new? Yeah, and the answer is they're almost all new. So in areas like business analytics, petroleum analytics, um, quantum engineering. So we, we're, we're trying to leverage our faculty strength along with topical areas that our corporate partners have indicated they're interested in. Yep, and then, uh, and then I guess the, the other question, there's sort of a few different versions of, of this in there, um, but it, essentially, are, is it, are they all, are all of our graduate programs online or are there going to be sort of in-person and online options for the same program? Yeah, all the, the 24 programs that I listed will have an online component. Several of them will also have an in-person component. And um, we still have our whole list of, extensive list of, graduate programs that are currently delivered in person. And several of those, such as mechanical engineering, uh, certain areas of mechanical, 
and uh, certain areas of electrical, et cetera, we are working to develop online components for those going forward. Okay, and, and Bill and Barb ask about the ETM program. So I, I, I know that's one of your favorite ones to talk about, so. Yeah, the ATM program is exciting. So there are three new uh, graduate certificates that uh, were developed and we're asking for approval on Friday for trustees. And the you stack those three certificate programs, then uh, students would have to take one additional course in order to get the ETM uh, non-thesis master's degree. So we're moving in the direction of trying to completely offer the ETM program in an online format. Okay. Yep. All right. So thanks, Rick. And then we'll, we'll, I think we'll handle some of the other questions as we, we, we go along. Um, Rick's talked about the academics. Dan's talked about student life. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about financial other than to say, um, you know, we're going to be in a position where we're dealing with essentially uh, revenue reductions from almost all of our sources. And uh, Kirsten uh, Volpe, our, our uh, VP, um, in charge uh, and chief financial officer uh, will be able to answer questions on those. But I'll just sort of say we're, you know, you've probably been reading a lot in the press about the um, reduction in, in state investment as well as other losses of revenue to universities and how that's really hitting the higher education sector pretty hard. From a mines perspective, we're, we're probably looking at a hole in our budget anywhere from 10 million to about $50 million, um, which, you know, depending on how you look at it is probably somewhere between about five and 20% of our budget. Um, so we're gonna have to deal with that, but we, we also recognize that students and their families are also being hit pretty hard right now as well. So, you know, in the, in the past, the, the response to this would be, you just raise the tuition to fill the hole. Um, we're not gonna do that. And uh, we're just gonna have to deal with it um, another way. And I know there were some questions about um, tuition and um, I think we'll, we may ask Kirsten that one, uh, we, we, the Q&A session, but, but our, our, our goal is we're, we're trying to help out students and their families as well as dealing with the realities of the, of the budget hole that we have to deal with. Um, the new thing we're gonna have to deal with, and, and a lot of you have asked questions about health monitoring and tracking and cleaning, things like that. Um, so yeah, we're, we're currently working on developing partnerships that will lead to, put our hope is on campus um, testing for, um, for the virus, uh, as well as potentially testing for antibodies. And we might be doing some um, test runs of the testing this summer during our second summer session. So we're, we're uh, having discussions with partners about right now, but that's going to be um, on, you know, the ability for students to be tested and, and staff and faculty as well um, is going to be a key part of our health plan in the fall. So uh, yeah, absolutely, we are working on, on, um, on, on those things. Um, you know, just sort of reflecting back on lessons learned uh, as we looked at sort of what we learned in, in our response in March and what we're doing in the summer, what we're planning for the fall. I think, uh, you know, one really cool thing is uh, we can do this, whatever, whatever works we're going to handle. Uh, and I'm pretty confident we can, we, we'll, we'll figure it out. What's been interesting to me watching this, and, and I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of students in various um, forums um, uh, since we had to go online and, and as recently actually as this morning as well, is when you, when you ask students sort of what they miss the most or what's most important to them, it, it, it's all the things that we think are important as well, right? It's, it's the, the students who come to minds really value that hands-on education, the, the in-person interactions with faculty, the ability to work in teams. And in fact, the hardest part, I think, when students had to go home and they couldn't come on campus was how to replicate that, that working with others component that's so important to them. Of course, um, challenge and peer encouragement is what keeps them going. Um, if they're sort of stuck in their rooms at home, um, it, it, the, the motivation isn't there as much as when you're working with others. Um, and of course, um, being able to replicate these extracurricular experiences that I highlight at the beginning of the presentation. And of course, their network to minds. If there is a silver lining in all this, it's that um, we have very rapidly become much more proficient in technology enhanced education and learning. Uh, and I doubt that we would have been at the level that we are today if this had not happened. Um, our, we have always said that we wanted our students to graduate being proficient and be able to learn online because many graduate and um, continuing education classes work that way. Uh, and also how to work together at a distance, which is um, how in many professions it happens today as well. So, 
um, we've, we've sort of accelerated that part of what we knew we needed to do. And the other silver lining this is I think it's much easier to engage all of you uh, as being participants, not as students, but being contributors to the, in the classroom setting. So it, I think it's much easier now to dial somebody in um, to be part of a class and contribute than, than it was before. So I think there, there is a silver lining in this. Uh, of course, we, we are, you can recognize and you can see this if any of you follow the press, the, the whole world is sort of reevaluating their higher education options and, um, and the cost benefit of things. And, and when you consider that, it's, it's pretty hard to distinguish yourself as an online provider. And, um, and of course, our students really value the, the they, they can survive in an online mode, but they really would prefer hands on in person um, working as teams and all those kinds of things. And so we, we know that's really important to us. And it, it all adds up to us saying that our strategic plan, our Minds at 150 vision is uh, more important than ever and more important than ever to accelerate um, if we, you know, if we want to continue to be the great school and the, the first choice top of mind university that we, we want to be. I'm not going to go through all this, but I'll just say um, if you'd like to learn more about a strategic plan, I'm more than happy to, to, to talk to you. But um, key components of it are ensuring that we are distinctive and differentiated and we we have to make sure we're doing that no matter what mode of delivery we are in um, we knew that we had to expand how we were offering things and, and diversify that delivery and of course this this pandemic has forced us to accelerate that aspect of our strategic plan we need to make sure we're aligned to the future and of course um, we've always said we need to increase the engagement of alumni in our programs and, and i think we we know how to do that more and i hope we take advantage of, of of all of you. And of course, we've, we've, we've also said that um, we need to add additional characteristics to MINDS graduates. They've always been hardworking, collaborative, and resilient. But um, adding the business uh, acumen, making really focusing very hard, making sure our students professionally prepared, and of course, uh, adaptable and prepared to lead. So um, we, will be, we will be making sure that we're doing those things. And um, we, haven't, we haven't pushed the pause button on the strategic plan. If anything else, we're anything we're pushing down the accelerator so um, I hope you will be part of all that and that that uh, brings up this sort of last phase of the presentation which is how can you help a lot of you ask questions about hey what can what, what can we do so um, uh, I'll, I'll just sort of say um, there's a lot of different ways you can you can get engaged um, Obviously, a lot of our students are, are in a situation where their internships fell through th for the summer or their full-time positions that they were hoping to start working when they graduate may have uh, evaporated or been postponed. And our career center is working really hard to um, help provide other opportunities for our students. But I think connections with all of you would be really valuable for them. Um, many of you have lived through experiences like this and um, you, you, can, you can offer mentoring and advice and maybe you know of other opportunities for, for students in, in your company. So um, that's one way uh, to be engaged and uh, we're happy to connect you to those if you're interested. Um, a, a, another way of, of being engaged is we have a, um, a student emergency fund and, and quite a few of you have already participated in this. Uh, again, this is sort of helping students out with, um, you know, their, their jobs disappeared, but they still had to pay their rent or their tuition or the books or whatever. And we're, we're trying to help them all out. And um, you know, the alumni board has really kicked in here. And many of you I know on this call have participated in this. And um, so that's, that's an option if you'd just like to um, sort of contribute to supporting students, there's the emergency fund. And then uh, you know, if, uh, if you're looking for other options as well, we've got this initiative going on in campus where uh, you can volunteer to help uh, you know, sew masks for, uh, for students in the, in the staff and faculty in the fall. So we've got a group that their goal is to produce 14,000 cloth masks um, by the fall. And uh, judging so far by the response from everybody, a lot of interest in this. Um, but if you'd like to participate in that, please please jump into that as, as well. And finally, just to wrap up, um, you can find out a lot about all of these things at weare.minds.edu. Um, you can find out how to get engaged as an alum. You can f figure out how to get engaged by supporting. Um, what, what, whatever there is, there's a lot of options on this uh, website. It's really easy to remember, weare.minds.edu. And I invite you to uh, visit that webpage and uh, explore and find some way that you can be involved in a way that's meaningful for you. 
And with that, um, Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Terrific. Thank you, President Johnson, uh, Dr. Holtz, Dr. Fox. Um, really appreciate it. We'll jump into the questions. Uh, there were a lot of them that were submitted um, previously. Um, and I'm going to kick off the, uh, the uh, session with a, kind of a combination of a number of questions that have come in. Um, and uh, I think every one of you could take a, a piece of this, but um, there were a lot of questions about how MINDS uh, intends to maintain the academic rigor that we're known for, the hands-on uh, experience, um, while also fostering the extra and co-curricular activities um, that make that, that MINDS experience so unique and special. Um, and Dan, you, you referenced the uh, professional uh, preparation, the clubs and orgs. How do you uh, balance all of that, especially going into the next fall? Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, it's an interesting exercise. And um, fortunately for us, even prior to all this happening, um, not just because of the Minds at 150 plan, but certainly as a part of that, um, we had already been working very collaboratively with uh, uh, the other agencies, particularly with academic affairs in terms of with the deans and, and the departments and where are those crossovers occur and where, where are those synergies that we can, we can take advantage of. Um, and um, uh, a good, I mean, with CASA and when I think of the Career Center and some of the obvious ones, but we, we're delving much, much more beyond that again with this idea that, um, as I, I don't want to be redundant, but the idea that, um, you know, these things have to, they, in order to really be signature, in order to really be distinguished, they have to be, you have to have the power of the compounded effort and the diverse effort. And so, um, but balance is an interesting question too. Um, we certainly know that it is a rigorous education and sometimes more isn't necessarily better. It's the right about a more, it's the right thing. So we spend a great deal of time as well thinking about what are the things that we have to either change um, or that have evolved into something different. And so as we work, it's um, student life is pretty much, you know, um, kind of a universal donor. We work with everybody. Um, we're a service department. And so uh, we take our cues from each other, learn what we can and make sure the student voice is always involved in that as well. Um, because sometimes we get so busy, we forget that um, their experience, they're the only ones that can provide that perspective. And so we only have so much time and so much energy. And so we want to make sure that we're putting it towards something that makes sense for the institutional mission and is beneficial for the students. And oftentimes we get calibrated by, by learning from the students, whether we're hitting that mark. And we certainly have through this spring as well. How about on the uh, academic side, uh, Dr. Holtz, President Johnson? Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. So uh, obviously the, the laboratory experiences and classes uh, working in the wood shop, metal shop, uh, those kinds of things are critical to that transformative minds education. So uh, starting this summer in the second summer session, as well as in the fall, we're prioritizing those specific types of classes as being hands on. And we're decreasing the density. So we're adding additional sections of laboratories and cornerstone and capstone courses in order to reduce the number of students to try to mitigate any transmission of COVID uh, and to have students wear masks and take other safety precautions. So we are well aware that that's a very critical part of a MINDS education. Also, the, the personal interactions with faculty is, also, is very important. Uh, so even if we have a course that's being delivered remotely, we're planning to have students take tests on campus for those that can, and we're planning to have uh, help sessions, tutoring sessions, recitations for those students in face-to-face -face format as well. So we uh, are very uh, in tune to one, and our students want that one-on-one -on -one faculty interaction. President Johnson, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about the you know what we see that students are learning um, as far as uh, you know how important that on-campus experience is, um, supporting each other and uh, that uh, um, being around each other and that that camaraderie is is really important to the experience. Sure, I'll just make it. I I think I kind of mentioned this presentation, but I'll I'll sort of say what's been what's been interesting about this this experiment that we've just done. 
this spring um, is, you, you know, for a long time, there's been a big discussion about, um, you know, is online education going to replace uh, a more traditional higher education? Uh, are bricks and mortars universities really needed? Um, you know, all, all those kinds of things. And what, what's, um, what's been interesting as a result of this experiment is um, how important all of those on-campus components are to our students. And, and actually, we believe as well. Um, to the education. And so that's, um, that's why uh, both Rick and Dan's teams and, and Kirsten's team as well are working really hard to figure out how to make sure that, that that's our priority for what we can deliver in person in the fall. It's anything that's got related to, to team-based work that's got hands-on components and all those kinds of things because, um, because that really is important both to us and to the students. And, uh, and of course it is, it is in many ways what makes uh, a Mines graduate an ore digger. So we're, we're very committed to, um, to, to all of that. And it's front and foremost in all of our discussions. That's great. Yeah, we, we got a lot of questions about that. So thank you all for responding. A lot of questions about athletics um, next fall. And uh, will we have football? Uh, will there be um, activities in general with athletics? Yeah, so let me handle that one. Um, so athletics actually falls under Dan's portfolio, but um, uh, but I am the, uh, so within our uh, conference, the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference, there's a President's Council, and I'm the chair of the President's Council of the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference this year. And uh, Dave Hansberg, our athletic director, is the chair of uh, the Athletic Administrators Council in the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference. Uh, what I can tell you with respect to athletics is there's, there's, um, there are a number of things in flux right now. So the first of all is the conference has to decide if there are going to be competitions um, uh, and what sports are going to have competitions. And then as a university, we have to decide if we want to participate um, within that framework. And of course, all of the schools that are involved in our conference are actually in um, not just one state, but many states, many counties. And they're all operating under different um, health directives and rules and things like that. Uh, and of course, we have to figure out some way that we are as um, protective of our student athletes as we are of the student body as, as a whole. So uh, what's happening right now is that uh, tomorrow morning, the presidents of all the universities in the conference um, meet. And we're having a discussion to make decision on some things. The, uh, Division two has already decided to um, reduce the minimum and maximum number of competitions expected to participate in championships. Uh, but the uh, presidents are meeting and having preliminary discussions tomorrow morning. And then in June, they will have discussions basically to make final decisions on um, under what conditions would the conference um, host a fall season uh, for each of the sports. So those are, those are ongoing discussions. Uh, of course, they change as we uh, about virus and, uh, and what others are doing. So um, what, what I can tell you is, is uh, and, I, and I will say with respect to the athletic programs, because I've been watching the questions coming in, I don't think of our athletic programs just as a series of competitions. So our, our student athletes really thrive on the structure of the program. They strive on the, um, basically the camaraderie of the team. They, they succeed because of all those things as well as their um, training that takes place that, that, that helps them academically. And at the end of the day, our priority is our campuses, our academics, uh, and, and of course the success of our, of our students. So um, I, I think there are, you know, there's a variety of, of options that may happen in the fall. There may be some sports that go forward and some that don't. Um, there may be, uh, I, I think in any case, uh, I think the plan would be that there are still structured team activities that take place and um, things that the student athletes are involved in. Um, but the actual decisions on the seasons and under what conditions uh, teams would participate and our decision to elect as a university to participate within the conference um, won't happen for, I would say, another two or three weeks. Um, so that's, that's when those decisions will be made. Awesome, thank you. Uh, 
uh, quite a few questions about the financial side of things. And um, one of the first questions that came in was about tuition uh, for the upcoming year. There have been questions about uh, refunds. Um, so maybe, um, Kirsten, if you wouldn't mind giving a little bit on uh, tuition and the financial situation and uh, some of the uh, other questions regarding there was a question that came in about uh, announcing faculty pay cuts and furloughs at the University of Arizona and so on. So uh, people are, seem to be curious about the financial health of the university. Sure, thank you, Brian. Um, so as President Johnson mentioned earlier, that we are, uh, we are very focused on the students and their ability to, um, to manage their financial situation this coming fall. And so we are, um, looking at tuition very closely. We've got a board meeting at the end of this week, um, and we hope to um, uh, have approval from the board of no tuition rate increases for our students. Um, we're also looking at very modest um, fee increases as well as uh, very modest room and board increases. Um, so we're, we are very focused on making sure that um, especially the tuition that we um, that we moderate and manage that as much as possible. Um, we did provide credits back to students when the students left in March. Uh, we credited them their housing, dining, as well as parking fees, which I think, um, you know, from a financial perspective, helped them out quite a bit as well. And then we did receive federal funds to, that went directly to students for um, emergency type funds and we've spent all that funding so the students have received um, everything that we've received from the federal government so that that has been a great help. Um, in terms of what MINDS is doing to manage um, really the headwinds that we see ahead and and really much of the uncertainty is we have enacted um, uh, several several elements for fiscal year 21 is we are having no pay increases, um, some significant operating cuts, travel freezes, uh, we will be implementing furloughs. The senior leadership team will be um, taking essentially pay cuts through furloughs. Um, and we are implementing um, many other um, cuts and freezes. Um, we've, we've, we've had a fair number of capital projects that we've put our pencils down and are waiting to see how, um, how this fall semester, how enrollment and occupancy manages. Um, so there's a fair number of um, cost containment measures that we're um, working on, as well as you heard Provost Holes talk about, there's a fair number of revenue generating opportunities um, that we see on the near term um, that we're really excited about and that we see that could um, really help from a tuition, tuition perspective. 80% of our um, operating revenue comes from having students enrolled in classes on campus. So enrollment and housing and dining is 80% of, of our operating. Um, only a small percentage, um, less than 10% of our funding comes from the state. Um, and while we do anticipate a cut, it's not, it, we don't anticipate a significant cut. So we're really um, reliant on enrollment as well as uh, students coming back and occupying those residence halls. That's Great, thank you. Uh, and maybe uh, on the theme of residence halls, there have been a lot of questions about um, what we're gonna be doing this fall with the residence halls. Will they be open? Will Jackson Street uh, be available? So perhaps uh, Kirsten and Dan, if you might um, address that, those questions. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start. We, we're gonna have two new residence halls this, this fall. Um, one is a 1750 Jackson right across the street from Safeway, so a great location. Um, we have certificate of occupancy. It looks great. We have um, a fair number of deposits and students ready to move in. So that residence hall will be ready to go um, for students uh, this coming fall. We also have another great residence hall, um, which is on the core of campus, essentially at the corner of 19th and Illinois, and that's called Spruce Hall. And um, we are anticipating that that hall will be open um, this fall uh, in time for the students to come back in August. Um, as you can imagine with um, several of our construction projects, they've been hit um, by this pandemic and, and the, um, the, the work has, um, has, has slowed a bit, but we have 
great anticipation that um, that hall will be open for, for opening day. Dan, you might want to talk about how you and your team are looking at um, the occupancy of those halls. Thank you, Kirsten. Yeah, similar to um, the intentions of the institution from an academic standpoint of trying to have as many in-person classes as possible, we're intending to have as many folks live in our residence halls as we safely can allow. So we've been working with a lot of agencies in the county and the health departments and uh, epidemiologists and so forth in terms of um, doing an, an audit essentially of the spaces, the augmentations that we would have to do to the building, whether it be for, for physical distancing, for restrooms and cleaning and so forth. But our intention is, is to um, have our residence halls um, there will be a reduction, I suspect, in capacity um, relative to what we would do pre-COVID-19. Um, but we will we want as many of our students to have that immersive and learning environment where they can go to class as well as do the out-of-classroom experiences in person. And so we're pretty close to um, a final recommendation for the executive committee to look at. That should happen in early June um, because we want to be able to obviously make announcements and we know that people are signing up. Our interest for the residence halls has been very strong. Um, this year in terms of um, returning students, sophomores for 1750 and for Maple and, and uh, upperclassmen for Mines Park and then our freshman class as well. Uh, our numbers have been very strong in terms of interest, but I know people are waiting and wanting to know, well, are we going to do it? And if we say yes, then there's a litany of questions that we have to be able to answer. And that's what we're, we're spending our time on, a great deal of time right now. But the intention would be um, we want to open, we want to open the buildings. We want to be able to provide the cohort communities um, and theme learning communities and all the other, again, opportunities outside of the classroom um, for leadership growth and development, for professional development and for vertical integration of experiences um, with freshmen integrating with sophomores, juniors and seniors. Um, so uh, I would suspect that uh, in the next two weeks, two, three weeks, and um, we will be able to provide an answer that we think that we can stick to as opposed to putting something out prematurely. Thank you. Uh, maybe building a little bit on services um, on campus, there have been several questions about uh, will there be additional health services? Will there be contact tracing on campus? Um, what are some other uh, preparations that the university is making uh, for the fall related actually to the, the, the health of, of students and the staff. Wow, I, I stumped well, the panel. So, no, yeah, I just didn't know, well, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, I was gonna say Dan owns the health center, um, but but he's like looking at the rest of us to answer this one. So, but um, I, so I'll, I'll, I'll just start and then Dan will, I think finish saying, uh, as I said earlier, um, uh, we are working on um, being able to test um, for the virus on campus. So, um, and we're looking at both, um, you know, testing to see if, uh, you know, if, if someone is um, uh, right, impacted as well as, um, you know, potentially by testing as, as well, and maybe a way of using the two of them synergistically. Uh, so we're ex exploring the testing world right now in partnerships for that. Uh, but there's much more, I think, to the health world than just the testing, which is what gets a lot of the attention. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, our student health center has been um, working on other components as well. There's both physical and mental health um, components that are, that are coming up these days. Dan, do you want to give a sense of the other things? Yeah, through um, our students, uh, through our student health insurance program, but also for our other students, we, d we did switch over in the spring to telehealth and telemental health in terms of students being able to do that um, virtually. Um, we've actually had strong response to that um, and pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, accolades as a result of that in terms of the results of things um, that are happening there. That is continuing for all students for next year. Um, 
president has cracked uh, the health center as well as the counseling center and the wellness center all do report to me as well. I feel actually very good about the partnerships. We have existing partnerships with some of the um, urgent care facilities and some of the hospitals in the area. So I have good hope in terms of whether it isn't just about testing as the president said, it's also about care. Care for the students that if they do become ill, um, part of our plan with housing and reduced occupancy is certainly focused on um, being able to um, self-isolate people so they can they can make sure that they recover and don't expose other folks. So we're working through that as part of the plan, but also then who's, who's gonna attend to some of those student needs during that time? And that will certainly be a part of student life's purview beyond just the health center. Um, we have a very good health center, but it's a fairly small staff, um, you know, nine or 10 total staff members. And so uh, when you think about people being able to get meals and potentially um, get excused absences, and if they have other needs, uh, they may need to get a medication that's not related to um, this illness and so forth. Um, that's part of what we're developing. And so um, I was reticent because I wasn't sure who wanted to answer the question first on this one, but there are many aspects to it. But I think, albeit the testing being incredibly important, um, I I, I'm attendant to the fact that there are a lot of other elements about this um, because again, uh, we, you know, these are our students. This is where, you know, this isn't a consumer exchange. This is an institution of higher ed. These are the people that we, that we care about dearly um, and that will come back for years and years and years to come afterward. And so we've got to make sure that we're covering as much of their needs and, and the ideas of what those needs may be medically, emotionally, physically, mentally, et cetera, uh, as we can. And so um, I feel pretty good about where we are because we already had a partnerships. Now we're asking them to expand um, their partnership with us. And I'll, maybe I'll just throw in three, three other things really quick since there were some questions on this. One, one is about contact tracing and, and absolutely, we're, actually we've already been doing that um, for the last few months. We've had a few cases on campus. Uh, we're doing that. We're actually looking at some, um, some phone apps that basically will allow us to monitor the health of our community in aggregate, as well as um, for individuals to know if they've been in proximity to somebody who, um, who's um, showing, uh, showing signs. So uh, we've, we've got those in play as well. And I, and I would say another component of the health plan is um, making sure nobody feels compelled to come to school if they don't feel well. And so the, the, this, this ability of ours to deliver all of our course mater material, uh, both in person and remotely and have recordings of everything. So students don't feel like they have to come to campus if they're not feeling well or they're concerned about things is another key aspect of the overall health plan. Um, and so the, the academic side of the house is, is um, working really hard in that component of things. Thank you. We're starting to uh, lose some attendees, and so in, in the interest of time, uh, perhaps we could end the Q&A with um, uh, just kind of some final thoughts from each of you, and I'm going to uh, set that up with a question from uh, uh, Harry Briscoe. Harry's on the uh, alumni board, and I think his, his question is appropriate. Um, and thoughtful. He, he asked, um, he'd like to hear a list of the pros and cons with regard to reopening this fall and how the leadership team went about evaluating the risks uh, associating with either. And obviously it's a, this is a, these are big decisions that you all are making. So maybe in closing some um, remarks and kind of how challenging it's been and what the, the, uh, the decision-making process has been like for each of you. I mean, I'll start off real quick. That's a dollar. Yeah, that's another dollar. Uh, so, you know, a, a big part um, for me in the decision making, and, and obviously, right, there's, we're looking at things across a pretty wide risk spectrum and a lot of uncertainty in, in what we know. And certainly the, the easiest thing is just to say, we don't want to deal with this. Everybody stay home. Everything is online. Um, but the reality is, is we've been listening a lot to the students um, and, uh, and, and what is it that they want from their education? Because they're, you know, look, they're, they're our future ore diggers. They're our customers. Um, they're, they're the consumers here. And uh, overwhelmingly, 
in any survey we've done, whether it be formal or informal, this is what they want. Um, they, they want uh, to be at mines. They want to be working with each other at mines. They want to have their hands-on experiences. They want to be challenged. Um, they need that community learning experience um, to continue going forward. And that's what, they've, that's what they've asked for. And they've, they've asked us to figure out how to do that in some way um, that they feel comfortable doing that. And that for those who don't feel comfortable, that they can still continue their education. And so those, those have been the sort of design factors that have gone into a lot of our decisions um, that, that we've been making, at least from, from my perspective. Dan, you, uh, you have some things that go on during the, the summer and um, leading up. We have a lot of great traditions. And, um, you know, how has that been uh, making that, you know, working through this um, been a part of your decision making process? Yeah, thank you. I know that there was previous questions uh, about ore digger camp and about um, fall convocation and the M climb and some of the traditions and the onboarding exercises that we do uh, annually um, and then further into the fall with homecoming and so forth. And so, um, yeah, we part of what the president just described has certainly been on my mind. With Ordigger Camp, we, we just did have to make the decision regretfully the other day that Ordigger Camp in its traditional format uh, will have to be canceled. Um, we're dealing with the venues with YMCA, the Rockies and other venues and they're not, they're not able to be staffed or open and it doesn't appear that they will be. Um, so with that in mind, um, our, our transitions program who works on that is immediately shifting over to, we don't want to lose the elements and the essence of what ore digger camp brings. So we will be providing a virtual ore digger camp. Um, and we hope that all the students uh, that we're going to sign up for the previous type of ore digger camp will do this as well. Um, it, it's, it's an incredible important part of starting off your journey at mines. So we're going to make it as best as we can. And so, when we can do in-person things, we're being as creative as we possibly can to be able to do that. When we can't, we can't. Um, and so we're having to make those decisions. So as a, an example of a hybrid in terms of, we're talking about convocation just today, and we're talking about, you're saying, well, how could you possibly do a convocation? Um, but with having a football stadium, there is potential to be able to spread people out more. Maybe not enough, we would have to see when we traditionally do that um, in the Lockridge Arena. So we would, we would try to shift or pivot our thinking as well. We have Celebration of Minds, which usually involves um, literally two to 300 organizations on the intramural fields. And what we're doing now is each of the organizations are creating two minute videos. We're gonna be able to show um, our incoming freshman class as well as our upperclassmen. We're also talking about could we um, pick some of those specific committees and, and, and organizations that are focused a bit um, towards what the president said with, with team concepts and with hands-on types of things. And could we socially spread those out as you've, you've seen in some places with gridding and things like that so we can provide a, a scheduled in-person experience, allow so many people in at a certain time. We've also talked about that with the M climb. You know, if there's one thing that most everybody identifies with beyond maybe E days, it's certainly the M climb. And so we've been working on that already for several weeks in terms of saying, could we do each CSM 101 cohort, spread them out in terms of that, doing it in a different way, frankly, than it would be in the past, but still give people that opportunity um, to make that cherished walk. Um, and, um, and so where we can do those things in person, we, we certainly are trying um, desperately to come up with creative ways to do that. Career day is another interesting thing. I've had lots of questions about the fall career day. Um, the fall career day, most definitely like Ore Digger Camp, will be a virtual experience. And frankly, that's as much from the companies who have trouble with potentially being able to travel um, to some of the sectors that are being, that are struggling a bit right now. The good news is, is that the companies were contacting us literally a month and a half ago because they're very concerned that they want to make sure that Minds is still going to provide a way to have access access to our students who are graduating, to our students that are interested in internships, um, because um, they, they understand the value uh, of a MINES graduate. And so it was encouraging that they were touching base with us before us having to touch base with them. But that will be a virtual event as well. Um, and uh, we've already, we're pretty far along with the plans with that as well. 
Um, and then the last one I mentioned is homecoming as well. To be completely honest, my thinking isn't quite that far out, um, even though I know people want to know because of um, they want to make plans and arrangements. You have re reunions around that time and very important activities. Um, oftentimes we have an athletics fundraiser around that time and so forth. But as the president alluded to, it's a bit premature from, from my planning purposes to because we're not sure what's going to happen with the season in that way. And, and so frankly, because the season could change if when we're, when we have that season, the, the homecoming date could potentially change as well uh, as a result, because um, it does depend on who's going to compete with us and who's not. So we are in a mixed metaphor, if you will, of, of where we can do these traditions in a traditional way or more traditional way. We'll lean that way as much as we possibly can where we can't, I don't want to give up and just say, no, we're not doing that. That will be my last answer. It'll be like, we, we'll do it in a different way. And not to just to be a facsimile of it, because those things are that important. These are traditions. These are onboarding experiences. This is how you start and develop a community. This is how you build that affinity, by sharing experiences, tough ones, different ones, and traditional ones. Thanks, Dan. Rick, if you wouldn't mind um, making some final comments, if you could weave in uh, some of the thought process around the uh, school calendar. And um, yeah. there were some several questions about that. But kind of your final thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Brian. We, we have been discussing the school calendar and uh, whether we should maintain our current calendar or make some adjustments. Uh, right now, I think the the decision is we'll, we will start on the 24th of August, um, where the, we still need to decide what we're planning to do is after Thanksgiving break. So do we want students to return to classes after having traveled at Thanksgiving break, or do we need to uh, have some of for our course delivery and, and finals week? So we're working through that right now and um, looking at a couple different scenarios for fall semester. I think that in just wrapping up, it's been uh, such a pleasure for me to be a part of the Minds community. And uh, I've been so proud of the faculty and the staff and the deans and the leadership team and how we've handled this uh, very difficult and unusual situation. But I think mostly I'm proud of our students. They're incredibly resilient. They're um, they're excited, even though they were taking classes remotely. They were all very excited about their experiences, about being able to finish off the year. And we've heard a lot of positive feedback about them being very excited to return to campus and uh, continue with their minds education. So um, I'm just very proud to be an orb digger and proud of all the people that I work with. Thanks, Rick. Kirsten, you have final thoughts? You you all are part of these uh, these details, you know, that still have to be worked out, and uh, there are a lot of decisions that have to be made. Any any kind of final thoughts for our audience? Yeah, thank you, Brian. And and you know, one thing that um, we've we've had paramount to any decision that we make is what's what's in the best interest of our students and our employees. Making sure that everyone is safe. You know, we've got a return to minds task force that is ensuring that our facilities are ready. Um, that our, our employees will be safe when we return, that the students will be safe. Um, and there's a significant amount of work that's going on around how do we make sure that everybody is, is, um, is safe when they return. You know, we've, um, we were the first university in Colorado out of the chute to provide students with credits back to their accounts for housing and dining. You know, making sure that we were doing right by the students. We think it's really important in this time just to show um, and continue to show how dedicated we are to our students and their success. So um, we haven't led, and I know there's a couple board members on the, on the call right now, but we haven't led finance drive us at all. We've led what is the right thing to do um, and that will make it work no matter what. So um, as Rick said, I'm proud. I'm proud to be part of this team and uh, just, just happy to, to be able to um, work through this, um, com, you know, unprecedented pandemic and, and make minds a better, you know, better place as we come out of it. Well, thank you all. Uh, Paul, I don't know if you have a, a last word and before we close things out, um, really appreciate all of you participating and certainly all of our attendees as well. 
Yeah, I just want to echo what you just said, Brian. Thank, thanks, everyone, for, for being here tonight. Um, again, you know, the, the, the thing that has always impressed me about Minds is the strength of the Minds community and how people really pull together when things need to get done. And I, I think we've, we've seen that, um, obviously, with, with, our, with our students. We've seen that with the faculty. We've seen that with the, 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 the team and the decision making. But we've also seen it with, with the alumni and, and uh, everybody else who's engaged with Minds being um, really, you know, being very supportive and wanting to be part of the solution and um, making sure, as Kirsten said, you know, we, we come out of this e even stronger than we were when we went into it. And in an even better position for the future. So I'm, I'm excited um, by what's ahead of us. Even though knowing there's a lot of work <laughs> in between um, that and uh, what the what the future will be. And and I really again invite all of you to be part of that. And um, feel free to reach out to me or anybody else here on the team. And um, we'll 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 find some way to. To, to plug you in and get you engaged. So thank you and stay healthy and stay safe. And I really look forward to the next time when we are all together and celebrating the awesomeness that is Minds. Well said, President Johnson. Um, I'll close this uh, uh, meeting um, out, if you will. Uh, you know, a couple of things I think that we heard this evening, we are committed to keeping Minds, Minds. And we're committed to keeping people safe. And that's, it's, uh, um, people on this call have been, are fully invested in doing what's best for our students, our community, um, and we can do this. And I think, uh, as President Johnson said, this is a unique opportunity for us, quite honestly, as an institution to separate ourselves. And Kirsten mentioned, we were the first uh, university in Colorado to issue refunds. That's pretty cool. And there are a lot of reasons to be proud. And all of us, and I, um, you heard from every single one of us, how proud we are to be a part of this team, to be part of the Minds community. And I hope you are too. Um, we can do this. It's an opportunity. Um, we, we need to do it together. And so we need to rely on uh, your support. Uh, private support is critical. Uh, your volunteerism is critical. Your advocacy staying connected is imperative um, and being supportive of what's going on, uh, staying engaged. Um, that will help us to grow this wonderful place uh, even bigger and better uh, than it is now and insuredly will um, make our Minds alumni proud as well. So thank you all. Uh, we're gonna close out with something really fun. It's the Minds football team singing the fight song after a victory in the locker room. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. You probably saw it on social media. Um, Coach Clem's become something of a, a social media phenomenon. Um, but uh, thank you all for attending and for your questions and uh, for being involved. We really appreciate it. Have a good night.